Welcome to the latest installment of my dad listens to this. I'm Juliet the daughter. That must make me Kevin the dad. And this week we are discussing, I believe it's this, this is an anniversary year for this album too. Or was that last year? 50. Okay. We are discussing Elton John and Bernie Taupin's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. So dad, what do we need to know? Well, we need to know that we've got a lot of ground to cover here since it's a double album. So we're going to do a Cliff Notes version of Elton John's life. So... If you'd like more information about Mr. John, as the New York Times likes to call him, mm -hmm. uh, read his autobiography, Me. Yep. Not to be confused with Catherine Hepburn's autobiography, Me. Me, yeah. Okay, anyway. Reginald Kenneth Dwight was born March 25th, 1947 in Pinner, Middlesex, London. He started playing piano at the age of four, and when he was 11, he won a scholarship to the Royal Academy of Music. Mm. One of his teachers said Reg was able to play back a four-page Handel piece after hearing it one time. Wow. Reg said he himself was not the greatest student. He could get away without practicing and scrape by on the grades. After six years at the Academy, he left, intending to break in the show business. He joined his first band, Bluesology, in 1961 and divided the time between playing with them and giving solo concerts at a local hotel. Hmm. He was a piano man, I guess. Yeah. Uh, by 1966, Bluesology became Wong John Baldry's backing band, touring around England. Reg eventually got tired of Baldry's control of the band, he was, so he responded to an ad for Liberty Records. He auditioned, but nothing came of it. However... Liberty did give him a stack of lyrics that had been submitted by one Bernie Taupin. Reg wrote music for the lyrics, and he and Bernie corresponded by mail. They'd meet in person six months later. By that time, Reg changed his name to Elton John. How'd he get that? Taking the names from bluesology sax player Elton Dean and from John Baldry. And now you know. Hmm. In 1968, Dick James hired Elton and Bernie as staff songwriters for Dick James Music. And boy, did they crank. Bernie could come up with song lyrics in about an hour. Whoa. And Elton could come up with the music in about half the time. Whoa. In 1969, Elton put out his first album, Empty Sky. It got good reviews, but didn't do much in the way of sales. For a second album, Elton and Bernie hired producer Gus Dudgeon and arranger Paul Buckmaster. And they were good moves on their part as both were instrumental to Elton's success. The self-titled Elton John came out in the summer of 1970, and it spawned the hit Your Song. Mm -hmm. His third album, Tumbleweed Connection, came out in late 1970. In 1971, he released three albums, A Live One, a soundtrack to the movie Friends, and Madman Across the Water. Madman did well, but it was 1972's Honky Chateau <laughs> that would propel him to stardom. He recorded it with his touring band, Davy Johnstone on guitar, D. Murray on bass, and Nigel Olsen on drums. Rocket Man and Honky Cat were the big hits, mm -hmm. and Honky Chateau also became Elton's first number one album. And now Elton and Bernie and band are just cranking out the hits like no one's business. Mm -hmm. From 1972 to 1976, they get 16 top 20 hits in a row Whoa. and seven consecutive number one albums. So when's the trouble -ish? Oh, it's coming. Oh, God. Uh, six of those albums came out from 1973 to 1975 because he's cranking out two albums a year. Two of those albums, Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy, and the follow-up six months later, Rock of the Westies, both debuted at number one. Wow. So there's tours featuring outrageous costumes and glasses and drugs and sex and... Oh, yeah, even some rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, Elton formed his own la music label, Rocket, but he stayed with MCA. He sang backup on John Lennon's Whatever Gets You Through the Night. Mm -hmm. Now, John didn't think it would be a number one hit, so Elton made a bet that if it did go number one, John would have to perform with Elton on stage. And we know what happened. It did hit number one. Mm -hmm. And John appeared on stage with Elton at Madison Square Garden on Thanksgiving 1974, and that would be John Lennon's last live performance. Well, that's something for Beatles fans to be grateful for. In 1975, Pete Townshend of The Who asked Elton to play the local lad in the movie version of Tommy. He did he, pretty good. Yeah, he did. He didn't fall off those shoes. He performed <laughs> Pinball Wizard, which was a hit, and Bally eventually came out with a pinball machine commemorating the Captain Fantastic album. Which is true. But uh, what I have to say is, <clears throat> I know your feelings about Tommy, but do you like Elton's cover of Pinball Wizard? I do, because that was the version I first heard. Okay. Then, 
Trablish? Trablish. Ah, uh, here we go. You knew it was coming at some point. I feel like but that's it's... the catchphrase for our podcast. And then, Trablish. And, uh, well, not like major Trablish, but Trablish nonetheless. Trablish enough. Yeah, in 1960, in 1976, Elton put out his double album, Blue Moves. It only coughed up one hit, Uh-oh. which happens to be my favorite Elton song. Which is? Sorry seems to be the hardest word. Oh. He came out as bisexual in Rolling Stone magazine, which at that time put a dent in his sales. Mm-hmm. In November 1977, he announced he was retiring from performing. Oh, well, which that didn't last. Lasted until 1978. Bernie Taupin started writing with other people. Uh-oh. Now, the thing is, Elton's still putting out albums, but he's only getting hits here and there. And he's still a chart presence, but not as much as he was from 72 to 75. So he's He's like in the lower top 40 and sometimes barely scraping the top 40. So basically he's what the kids would call mid, like middle of the road, just eh. Yeah. Then the 80s. Elton and Bernie reunite. Elton played Live Aid. Teamed up with Gladys Knight, Dionne Warwick, and Stevie Wonder for That's What Friends Are For. Nice. Which raised funds for HIV and AIDS research. Yep. In 1988, Sotheby's auctioned off Elton's memorabilia, mostly the concert costumes and glasses. Mm-hmm. Oh, and he also got married to one, I'm going to blow this name up, I know it, Renate Bloil in 1984. They divorced in 1988. I wonder why. Uh, he'd go on to marry David Furnish in 2005, they mm-hmm. being partners since 1993. Mm-hmm. And I guess with Renate, there was some sort of agreement that um, when they got divorced that um, it wouldn't be publicized, like mm-hmm. he would never talk about it. But he talked about it in the autobiography, she sued, and they managed to settle out of court. Oh, boy. Then the 90s. He beats both drug addiction and bulimia and has hair replacement surgery. Which actually looked pretty good. Yeah, it did. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have known unless you told me. No. I just told you. Yeah. Yeah. In 1992, he and Bernie Taupin got inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Which they deserve. Yeah. In 1994, he teamed up with Tim Rice for Disney's The Lion King. Three of his songs are nominated for an Oscar, so odds were pretty good that, you know, Elton was going to win at least one, which uh, he did. Yeah, for, uh, Can You Feel Love Tonight? What were the other two? It was Circle of Life and... Uh... Would have been, I just can't wait to be king. That sounds good. Yeah. Also in 1994, Elton gets inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Which he deserved to. That was the first year he was eligible. Yeah. And in 1997, he asked Bernie to rewrite the lyrics for Candle in the Wind to honor Princess Diana, Mm -hmm. who had died. Yep. Um, It wound up selling 33 million copies worldwide, 11 million in the U.S. alone. Sounds about right. And it won a Grammy for Best Male Pop Performance and raised a shit ton of money for Diana's charities. And oh, lest we forget, what? we cannot forget his cameo in Spice World. Oh, yeah. Also in 1997. Jess and Andrew talked about that, and he's. It, they said it's weird watching it because he's like being flirtatious and like into the Spice Girls, and it's like, Elton, this isn't you. <laughs> As for the 2000s and up to now, more albums, more honors, more tours, and... A final tour called Farewell, Yellow Brick Road. Mm -hmm. It started in 2018, and it was supposed to end in 2021, but we know what happened. Yeah. Yep. COVID, for those of you who don't know what happened. Yep. Um, His last performance was in Stockholm, Sweden on July 8th, 2023. Of the tour? Yeah. Mm. And, oh yeah, that was that biopic Rocket Man starring Taron Egerton Mm -hmm. as Elton, whom you may remember as Eggsy in the... um, King's Kingsman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun movie. Um, as for Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, get this. Bernie wrote the lyrics for the album in two weeks. Whoa! Yeah, that's nothing. Elton wrote the melodies in three days while staying in Jamaica. How? Wait, was he up all night? Or did he just... Wow. I'm trying to think of, like, their work schedules. Was it drug-fueled? Could oh, be. sure, yeah. Could be. Yeah. But they cranked. Yep. Now, Elton wanted to record the album... In Jamaica, because the Rolling Stones had just recorded Goat's Head Soup there, which was the Stones album that would signal their decline and fall. Uh Anyway, there were logistical issues 
what with the Joe Frazier, George Foreman fight taking place around the same time, oh. and political and economic protests in Jamaica. Yeah, get out. <laughs> yeah, so they decided to get out whilst the getting was good, and they wound up at Chateau de Laville in France, where they had previously recorded Honky Chateau in Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player. They recorded it in two weeks Jeez. with Gus Dudgeon producing. The band plays on all the songs except for this song has no title. Elton just plays everything on that one. Okay. So Goodbye Yellow Brick Road came out on October 5th, 1973. Mm -hmm. It debuted at number 17 on the Billboard 200 albums chart, and it only took four weeks for it to hit number one. Mm -hmm. Three singles were released in the U.S., Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, and Benny and the Jets. Candle in the Wind was released in the U.K., Mm -hmm. Harmony was supposed to be the fourth U.S. single, but there was a timing issue as Elton's next album, Caribou, was coming out. Because, again, he's cranking out two a year, and they wanted to start releasing singles from that album. Oh. Now, Harmony was used as a B-side for Benny and the Jets, but stations played it anyway, especially WBZ in Boston. Mm -hmm. It hit number one on their playlist and was their number six song at the end of 1974. Mm -hmm. Now, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road got good reviews for the most part. Yes. However, Rolling Stone's original review is absolutely blistering. Whoa, why? If you go on their Rolling Stone's website, you should be able to call it up and to read it because I think they give you like so many free reads before they want yeah. you to sub subscribe. Who was the music critic at the time? <clears throat> I can't remember, but Did I Google it quickly? Can here's I... the thing. Yep. The Rolling Stone album guide would go on to give it five stars. Okay. Now, whoa, the first the first line that comes up on Google, this new record is a big fruity pie that simply doesn't bake. But oh, Lord, how it tries. Sheesh. Wow. Gives Ben Brantley a run for his money. Wow. OK, now. Th Thankfully, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road came out with a lyric booklet. Mm -hmm. Elton John is a true believer of rock and roll singing. Be unintelligible on the verses, but sing those choruses clearly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he doesn't even do that. No, yeah. No. But hey, that's what, you know, the internet and lyrics are for when you Google them. Oh, thank God for that. Yep. Um, Goodbye, Olympic Road is Elton John's best-selling album with sales of 20 million copies worldwide. Mm -hmm. Now, as for me, I know a handful of songs. And I figured, oh, I'll take a shot. And I bought the 1995 remaster. Then later, I got suckered my into buying the 2014 40th anniversary remaster. Mm -hmm. And I didn't notice much of a difference in overall sound quality. Okay. But, but I kept the 1995 booklet because the lyrics were a lot easier to, to read. read. <laughs> they weren't in teeny weeny eye strain vision. Maybe they figure if people can Google them, you don't need to print the lyrics on the paper anymore. Yeah, because MCA skipped on the number of pages for the 2014 booklet. Oh. And made everything teeny, even the illustrations. And I thought, you know, screw that. <laughs> um, a Goodbye is one of three Elton John albums that I have. The other two are Rock of the Westies mm -hmm. and Greatest Hits Volume 2. The American version, not the international version, which is the only one available these days. And whenever I review that album, I will be nitpicking and griping away about that. Go ahead, fine. Um, as for the cover... Okay, the album is called Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, but right? He's walking towards the yellow brick right. road. Right, thank you. Maybe it's like supposed to be like the start of the journey and then the end of the album is when he gets off the yellow brick road? I don't know. I could buy that. But I'm thinking, is it possible he's backing out of the poster? Like he decides, yeah, I'm going to go on the yellow brick road. No, no. I'm going to say goodbye. And he's kind of like looking out to make sure he doesn't bump into anybody before he steps off. Right, Okay, right. I could buy yep, that. Yep, yep. You know, because why travel on Yellow Brick Road if you're saying goodbye to it? Uh -huh. And this is what keeps me up at night. <laughs> anyway, let's dive into the songs. Oh, yes, let's. First track, Funeral for a Friend slash Love Lies Bleeding. This is a funeral, but very 70s. I think for the opening to work, it just needs to be a pipe organ. Because playing all those chords on a synth at once, the notes almost sound like static and are uncomfortable to listen to on headphones. And when the regular piano comes in, the volume of the keyboard and the sound of a real instrument are the breath of fresh air. And you find yourself vibing to all the instruments as the electric guitar and techno instruments layer in. It's very orchestral, not in the same way as ELO, but there is a drama, especially with the castanets. And listening to it, it makes sense that Elton went on to score for films and write musicals with Tim Rice. 
But with instrumentals that go on this long, I realized it would be more engaging for me if I saw them performed live, and even then I still zone out. When Love Lies Bleeding kicks in, Elton gives us the context for the instrumental. One year ago today, his lover left him and said the pacing was too much. Sounds like another groupie who got away, a la the airport giveth, the airport taketh away. Now the love is with another man, and Elton and Bernie can't write songs for this person anymore. Their inspiration has dried up. It made sense to pair these two songs together, but eventually I tune it out and I'm just waiting for Candle in the Wind to come on. Uh -huh. Now this is really two songs played as one piece. Yes. However, both songs are published and copyrighted individually. So originally they looked at it as, yeah, this album has 18 songs, not 17. Anyway, Elton created Funeral for a Friend for himself because he caught himself thinking, what kind of music would he like at his funeral? Hmm. So whenever that day comes, this had better be played. Yeah, if not, he'll come back to haunt us. Probably. Yeah. And this piece is about as prog rock as he'd ever get, thankfully. Elton prog rock. But That's also, wild. thankfully, uh -huh. it's not boring. It just builds and eventually leads into Love Lies Bleeding, a breakup song. And he played rock and roll. She was a fan. But my guitar couldn't hold you, so I split the band. And she still left. And, El and Love Lies Bleeding in his hands, and it's just all over the place, and it's gross, and someone needs to clean it up. Mm -hmm. And he can't believe she's gone and with another man. But he thinks the wind of change might bring her back. And to me, Love Lies has a Stones feel about it, but Elton definitely puts his stamp on it with the piano in the foreground more so than the guitars. Um, good opening, sweet, I guess you'd call it. Sure, why not? Next track, Candle in the Wind. Okay, I'm going to talk about the two versions, Norma Jean and Princess Diana. Oh, so am I. For Norma Jean Baker, if you know anything about Marilyn Monroe's life, then this song is a pretty accurate description of all the bull that Hollywood put her through. Made her change her name, exploited her body, then she turned to pills and died. Married three times, most famously to Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller. There's this line from Smash, For a kiss they paid a thousand, yet they paid fifty cents for my soul. Nobody gave her a break. The men, Hollywood, or the press. Or the Kennedys. Kennedys did it. Yep. And she tried to be taken seriously, taking classes at the actor's studio with Lee Strasberg, but she still died heartbreakingly. No, she was Stanislavski, not Strasberg. My apologies. She's so tragic, but there's a lot to admire about her. Like when someone said she was only beautiful because of her clothes, so she did a photo shoot in a potato sack, which you can find online. What a baller move. And I feel like this song provides emotional catharsis for Marilyn's fans who always thought she was gorgeous and never stopped loving her. This is an ode for the fans who always love and appreciate someone, even when it feels like everyone else is against them. It's solemn and beautiful and tenderly sung with an almost angelic choir. And like a candle in the wind, people try to push her around to bend her to their will, but she still shone brightly and stood out. As for Princess Diana, Elton and Bernie knew this song was inappropriate, but the rewrite they did was beautiful, and you could tell they were trying to approach this seriously and with respect, even though The Firm was not happy with this at all. But Diana was his friend. What the hell else was he going to do? And there's a different catharsis in the video of him singing this at the church, because he's singing this while all of England and the world is watching on TV and grieving. Again, sung with nothing but respect and admiration in a church where the piano echoes beautifully along with his voice. I mean, the acoustics are great. And when Elton chooses to dial it down, it's for a reason. And I always admire people who can sing at funerals when you can tell they just want to collapse and cry. I've been there and his performance was beautiful. Okay. It was Lee Strasberg that she studied with. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got confused. Stanis because... Maybe it was the Stanislavski method. Yeah, they were teaching uh, the Stanislavski method. My brain broke for a minute. Okay. Anyway, yeah. yes, Bernie wrote this about Marilyn Monroe, but in 2020, he said it could be about anyone who died young and became an icon forever frozen in their youth. So anyone like in the 27 Club? Well, he listed James Dean, mm -hmm. Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain, yep. Sylvia Plath, and Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. um, he said he got the phrase candle in the wind from record executive Clive Davis, who used it to describe Janis Joplin. Yeah, that works. And the cake taker, mm -hmm. Bernie said he just wasn't a big fan of Marilyn. Really? Yep. Well, he, he sure faked it really well in this. Now, I am, though. And mm -hmm. here's the thing. Yeah. I've just never been crazy about this song. Really? And I don't know why. There's something about I just cannot put my finger on it, and I've never been able to. And for this podcast, I just listen to it over and over Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is, but there's just something where, meh. Okay. But the thing is, I've never skipped over it. I've just let it play. Yeah. 
Maybe I just do it for Marilyn. <laughs> I don't know. You know, blondes are my weakness. I you did, married one. I married one, yep. Yep. And yes, there's the 1997 <laughs> version for Diana. That eye roll, wow. And believe it or not, yeah. I listened to the whole thing for the very first time for this podcast. Really? You never, you avoided it, huh? It was like, oh, it's coming down, click. <laughs> and all I can say is, poor Diana, she deserved better than this. Really? Why? 33 million people bought this, but 33 million people can be wrong. I find the, ly- the lyrics are labored. And they're definitely not as memorable as the Marilyn version. Oh, I like and I think it was only I think it was only meant as like a one shot. Yeah. But then it was like made available for purchase. Well, for her charity, so they could make some money. Yeah, yeah. But Elton said eventually he had some misgivings about the remake. He said he couldn't understand why people would want to listen to this and under what circumstances. Because it was so horrible. What happened? I know, and I quote, I almost felt like I almost it almost felt like wallowing in her death as the mourning for her got out of hand. I really don't think that was what Diana would have wanted, and I didn't want to do anything to prolong it further. And as such, he has made it a stipulation that it will never appear on any Greatest Hits compilation, and he will never talk about it in public. Well, at least good for him that he you know, had the sense to rein it in. I mean, I guess he realized, you know, the palace is asking me to do this one thing, and I kind of can't turn the monarchy down, so I've got to do it just this once, and then afterwards I'll stop. They asked him to play it or they asked him to write a song? I, th- I don't know exactly what happened. I mean, according to mom, and that's what I know, is like they asked him to play Candle in the Wind and he went, this is completely inappropriate. And they said to Bernie, we got to rewrite this because we cannot play the original. Yeah. And so then they rewrote it. Oh, okay. And it's interesting because I remember Harry was talking, because I read Prince Harry's book. And people are like, what do you remember from the funeral? He's like, I don't remember anything. I don't even remember Elton John singing. He was just. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Next track. Benny and the Jets. This song is just pure fun. I remember when I first heard it, I thought it was a live recording because that's how good the illusion is. There's even that fake piano intro as if to be like someone who's setting up the piano and accidentally hits the keys before walking off the stage, which nice touch. And Billy Joel's cover of this at the Kennedy Center Honors was pretty good and pretty legit. Then there's the sound of the audience slowly starting to applaud as they see their favorite performer come on stage and Elton has the echo from the microphone. Then the real piano intro starts, and it's got the groove of drums and the consistency, too. And Elton makes it really catchy with his performance with the Bubba Benny and the Jets, and with how he hisses the letter S on the word Jets. I remember singing this song at an audition at the Young Actors Summer Institute because my musical theater director, Rachel Warren, wanted an example of singing a pop song. And I was like, what's one I know? (gasps) I know! And I remember singing. And I just had fun and had a ball, and I hit those notes, and Rachel was dancing in her seat. It's a good memory. So, with this song, and it's just a fun, good time. And also, when Elton John hosted The Muppet Show, Scooter comes in and starts playing this song, and Kermit goes, that's the worst song I've ever heard. It's not melodic, and I can't understand the lyrics. And Elton looks at Kermit and goes, I didn't think that when I wrote it. And Kermit's just immediately (laughs) backpedaling. Oh, Kermit, will you never win? No. Um, Bernie wrote this about, and I quote, a proto-sci-fi punk band fronted by an androgynous woman. That sounds interesting. I'm surprised he didn't call it Bernie and the Jets. Yeah. Anyway, this song is sung from a fan's point of view. Mm-hmm. And to me, the verses make no sense. Like we're going to fight with our parents out in the street to prove who's right and who's wrong. Maybe that has to do with like the intergenerational conflict about rock and roll. That's deep. <laughs> um, for me, the song is just all about the chorus. Now, what's with the fake live studio effects, you may ask? Yeah. Now, producer Gus Dudgeon said, Elton came in one bar early with the piano chord. Uh And as Gus was doing the mix, that kept coming up. And he thought it sounded like what people do on stage before they're going to start a song. Yeah, exactly. The techies are setting up the instruments and then they walk off. Right. So he decided to, and I quote, fake live it. The crowd noises come from a 1972 Elton concert from the Royal Festival Hall in London and from a 1970 Jimi Hendrix concert at the Isle of Wight. Oh, interesting. And the whistles come from a show in Vancouver. Now, back to those lyrics. The line about she's got electric boots and the mohair suit. Back in the fifth grade, my fellow classmate David Norberg was insistent that Elton was singing She's Got Electric Boobs. Yeah, I think I remember this story a little bit. Yeah, yeah, because, hey, you know, it, it was the 70s. And you were in the fifth grade, puberty was starting. <laughs> well, my cousin David was a huge 
Elton John fan. I think he still is. Mm -hmm. And so he had the lyrics and you mm -hmm. got to read, you know, it's electric boots. So now you know. And, you know, me being the um, the party pooper that I am, I informed Dave and he was just crushed. Sorry, Dave. But he was like still listening. insistent, like, no, it's boobs. It can't be boots. <laughs> and so that ends side one. Side two? Mm -hmm. Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road. Goodbye, Newman. I'm obsessed with how Elton John sings the word toad in an English accent. Toad. And I'm like, wow, okay. Listen to the song and you'll know what I mean. I have definitely heard this a lot growing up, but I never paid attention to the lyrics because the music and the singing was so beautiful. And I agree with one of the commenters. The song sounds heavenly and hurts like hell. Elton went to the big city to get famous, and he became some rich person's plaything. He respects himself and his dignity, so he decides to go back home. Pack it up and go back on the farm. I think this is Bernie to open. Uh, I think this is Bernie being autobiographical because he was recently on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me a couple weeks ago. And he said that he lived in the rural countryside of England where the only two options were to be a farmer and something else. I don't remember what the other one was talked about. A songwriter? No, but it was like specific in that area of England where you only had two options. Maybe it was a minor or that that's probably in York. Anyway, uh. Elton decides to leave the world of glitz and glamour for stuff that's more real, like the owl, the woods, and the hornback toad. You feel sad that his dreams don't work out, but on the other hand, you're happy that he respects himself and chooses to do what's right. The only thing that makes it sad is the moment where he has to face his father who's going to look at him like, told you so. That's a moment no one wants in their life. A beautiful, melancholy song. I'll try not to give you a told you so. <laughs> um, yeah, Bernie said this song was about him wanting to leave Oz and getting back to the farm. Um, which I'm sure is a metaphor for getting away from the craziness of the world in which he and Elton inhabited mm -hmm. and getting back to something simple. But this comes across as a bitter kiss off. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't hold me forever. I didn't sign up with you. I'm not yet a present for your friends to open. This boy's too young to be singing the blues. See ya. Um, I have no idea what where the dogs of society howl means. Unless it's an insult to the hangers-on and wannabes he's surrounded by. Yeah, this is a could be. That could work. And the lines about back to the howling old owl in the woods, hunting the horny back toad. Mm -hmm. I guess I've never heard an owl howl. I've heard him hoot loud. Yeah. And, you know, there are screech owls, but they only screech when they're defending their nests or their kids. Well, owl and howl rhyme. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And horny toads. There is such a thing. Is they, are, back toe? yep. they are indigenous to the desert, and they are actually lizards that are toad-bodied, which I don't know what that means. But um, anyway, I've always thought it was a good song. Mm -hmm. For me, it's not a great song, but I can't argue with it. Musically, it sounds great. <clears throat> okay, next track. This song has no title. Yep, you heard that right. I think maybe it's because this song is trying to capture the spirit of music or the spirit of the artist. And they thought there wasn't really a good term for that or a good enough phrase to describe what they're trying to feel. Do what Bob Dylan did. Pick a vague phrase and slap it on the song. It's very melodic as Elton describes how he doesn't want to be innocent. He wants to live a full life and feel everything. It's simple and beautiful. Again, it's dialed down for Elton John, but it really works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this seems to be about someone who wants to experience everything in life. And I mean everything. Wants to see the garrets where artists have died, courtrooms where judges have lied, down alleys where murders are done, and a rocket to the core of the sun. It's kind of all over the place, kind of like life. But I think you have to be careful living life like that because flitting from experience to experience, um, you can become a jack of all trades, mm -hmm. master of none, mm -hmm. which I am guilty of that. It's like, ooh, let's try too. it, ooh, let's try it, let's let it, and then, you know. Let's do this thing, let's do this thing. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, squirrel. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, and I thought, well, maybe it's called The Song Has No Title because you really can't label that song that we call life. <laughs> um, this is the shortest song on Goodbye Yellow Brick Road and Elton plays everything. And I also think this title would make a great Abbott and Costello routine like Who's On First. <laughs> hey, yeah, bet. What's the theme of this song? This song has no title. B but all songs have titles. So what's the title of the song? This song this has no title. And so on and so on. Yeah, so on. you're right. That would have been great. Next track, Gray Seal. The opening reminded me of Pinball Wizard. Yeah. Maybe this is how he got the job. I think the emotion that sums up this song is frustration. First, the frustration at not being taught everything in school or the things you were interested in. Second, frustration with how bleak the world is. 
the sun not shining as brightly as it does on the big screen. Thanks, David Lean. <laughs> and third, being frustrated that there are creatures who have lived longer than you and seen it all and have some wisdom you don't. Great seal, Gray Seal could either be the literal animal or the title of a yogi Elton visits somewhere. You pick. The song makes you bob your head, but then really rocks around the three-minute mark. I think that's him pounding out his frustration on the keys. Very interesting track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bernie said he didn't have a clue what he was writing about. Just he was on drugs. Just random images. Yeah. So if he doesn't know what it's about, you know, what chance do I have? You gotta admire his honesty, though. He wasn't gonna BS his way through it. Like, oh, it's this deep life meaning thing. He's like, ah, shut I, up. I have no idea. Yeah. But yeah, there are there are people who say, you know, what you said about the education thing, like, you know, I've gotten shortchanged and yeah. and you know, thanks for nothing and you know, mm -hmm. spent twelve years in school and I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Um who was the Bob Dylan line? Spent twenty years in school just to work for the on the day shift. Something like that. Oh, what was it that the cramps said? I learned everything I needed to at the age of nine. <laughs> yeah, knowing the American school system. Oh, that book, I learned everything I needed to know in kindergarten or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, catchy song, though. Um, maybe that's the true meaning of the song. Write whatever you want, just keep it catchy. Mm -hmm. Next track, Jamaica Jerk Off. Hopefully YouTube won't take us down for saying the title. I beg your pardon. This sounds like a vacation fling or a vacation love. Like, you went to Jamaica... And you not only wound up in bed with a woman, you wound up in bed with Grace Jones. And the emotions ride the, uh, waves. I don't know if you could use this in a commercial for travel, but it is fun. Now, here's my question. Was this pre-Jimmy Buffett? I don't know. Because I was thinking, is this where he tried to get his style from? I mean, I knew he and Elton were friends in real life. But this is, yeah, they were. But this is an example of turn your brain off and let the music wash over you. Pleasant and fun, but doesn't stick with me. Mm -hmm. uh, the songwriting credit on this one is to Reggae Dwight and Toots Toppin. Yeah. In 2016, Elton said, it's just about going to Jamaica and having a good time. And that's it. There's nothing else to this song. And, well, he was and that was it. in response to people being offended by the song 43 years after its release. Because they said it enforced negative stereotypes, and Elton uses a Jamaican patois in some of his singing, so cultural appropriation. <sighs> mm -hmm. A Prince Rhino was credited for vocal interpretations, but allegedly that's producer Gus Dudgeon, so more CA. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's just a fun song, and it's a decent attempt at reggae. Yeah. But if you want to hear the real thing, I recommend Toots and the Maytals. Okay. As opposed to Bob Marley and... People are going to come after me if I say this, and I'm going to say it anyway. I think the man is kind of overrated. Okay. Yeah, because it's like, you know, everyone's listening to him while he's stoned, and they must think, wow, it's the greatest thing ever. Uncle Joey's going to kill you. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> <clears throat> Next track. I've seen that movie, too. Have you ever seen someone lie so badly you immediately knew it was fake? That's what this song is, and it's a call-out ballad. I love the key that this song is in as well as the piano intro. I wonder if either Elton or Bernie was in love with a performer. Because that can happen too when you're dating an artist who doesn't know when to turn it off. There's another interpretation of this song. Someone who's in a relationship just so they can get a better performance, like I'm only using you for my art. And yet the ballad goes on too long for me, although the instrumental with the orchestra and distorted electric guitar is so beautiful. At one point the guitar sounds like weeping. Sire tracked. It was worth it just to get to that part. Maybe they'll introduce the instrumental sooner and end on that. That's just me. And I did see that artwork you sent me. That was beautifully drawn. Mm -hmm. This is one of the bitterest breakup songs ever. He's onto mm -hmm. her ways. He knows what's coming and tells her, baby, you're crazy if you think you can fool me because I've seen that movie too. Which makes me think, well, maybe he did the same thing to people at some point if he knows all the moves. Or mm -hmm. all the lines. Mm -hmm. And I love how this song sounds. It has such a cinematic sweep to it. And I can imagine someone putting a reel together of classic breakup scenes to this song. Oh, God, that would make... That's... I, I feel like people who would watch that are just, like, flagellating themselves at that point. Yeah. Uh -huh. Del Newman's orchestral arrangement really makes the song. And no relation to Randy, by the way, I checked. Huh. Um, this is probably the only song on Goodbye Yellow Brick Road where I'll play it again as soon as it ends. 
I never get tired of it. This is the second longest song on the album, clocking in a second under six minutes, but it's never seemed that long to me. And the reason I sent you that lyric book illustration is because it inspired the creation of Comedy Central's Mystery Science Theater 3000. 3000. Oh, yep. yeah. Okay, maybe I'll make that. Here's what I'm thinking. Should I make that the thumbnail for the podcast or should I do the original album cover? It's your call. Okay. And so this is end of side two. Now, uh, next album, because it's a double one. It's okay, we go to side three. Okay. Sweet Painted Lady. Fun fact, I think this is in the same key as Sexy Sadie. Anyway, this song could be about two things. First is a prostitute with a painted face being makeup. The second is it's about a prostitute who has been amused for many artists. And I think to sell that point home, there's a French-sounding accordion, which could be a nod to the escapades of French artists or writers, Victor Hugo in particular. But in Elton's case, he's playing a sailor. There's some melancholy to this song that really works and makes it stay with you due to the subject matter and the key they keep it in. There's no key change, really, or it just stays in, stuck in this same old, same old as it's the same old routine when the sailors visit the Painted Lady. I wonder if someone ever wrote a song from the Painted Lady's perspective. That would be interesting. Sad, but I enjoyed it. And also for the Avatar fans, no, this is not the Painted Lady that Katara pretends to be in Season 3. No, 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 no. Uh-huh. I, I kind of call this song, Hey Sailor, New in Town, the musical. Yeah. <laughs> You got those lines, oh, sweet painted lady, seems it's always been the same, getting paid for being late, guess that's the name of the game. Gee, mm -hmm. you think? <laughs> and that's all I have to say about that song. Okay, next track, Ballad of Danny Bailey. This feels like a scene in an old black and white movie where somebody comes into a pub and says, they shot so-and-so, and everyone in the bar reacts and starts commiserating. This feels very much like English, Irish, Scottish pub culture, where everyone knows everyone and they come together and talk about their lives. But then Elton said Kentucky, and I was thrown. Maybe they have a similar culture down south, I don't know. But I really like the story of this song a lot. And it's an instance where I don't mind it ending on a fade out. Okay. I've never had that before on the show, I don't, I don't believe. Okay, so the complete song title is The Ballad of Danny Bailey, 1909 to 1934. So right off the bat, we know he's dead. Yep. <laughs> Killed by some punk with a shotgun outside the motel rather than a hotel. So it's a seedier death. Yep. Um, the singer seems to be either a fan of Danny's not-so-legal exploits or he knew Danny when Danny was protecting this guy still to make illegal booze. Without Danny Bailey, we're going to have to break up our stills. 1934 was a busy year for the police and the feds. Oh, I wonder why. John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, mm -hmm. Pretty Boy Floyd, and mm -hmm. Baby Felix Nelson. And those last two sound like Dick Tracy bad guys. They, kind of they were all killed that same year. Oh, wow. And the fictional Danny joins them, and the harvest is in. Because mm -hmm. they went out and they reaped everyone. Mm-hmm. Bang you dead, bang you dead, bang you dead. Okay, let's bring them all in. Mm -hmm. This song is okay. Next track, Dirty Little Girl. My first note, Dan Elton is brutal in this one. He says there are women who are down in their luck, and then there's women like you who I will shoot if you step on my property. I guess Bernie and Elton were both fascinated with the sticks. He's basically calling her trash. It's like, oh, oh, damn. And if there's anything worthwhile in her, then you got to give her a good scrub and hope her social worker finds it. No other words to say than, dang. Although I got sick of him saying dirty over and over, the taunting kind of went on too long at that point for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is dirty in the actual sense of the word. Yeah. Because Elton sings, I bet she hasn't had a bath in years. As for the girl herself, she really seems to be down on her luck. Yeah. The police come and move her along. She has a job washing people's stairs, and even Elton threatens to shoot her in the ass if she shows up in his yard. Do you know what it takes to make, an en and to make an Englishman go all hillbilly and be, get off my property? God. Not much? I guess. Well, they do have hunt culture in England, so. Mm. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's an okay song, I guess. Next track, All the Girls Love Alice. All of them? A song about a lesbian? <laughs> Pretty ballsy stuff for the 70s. And when he sings the girls calling for her, it's seductive, like a siren song almost. Really cool to hear. Poor little darling with a chip out of her heart. It's like acting in a movie when you got the wrong part. And then Alice is dead? That blows. A song that took me by surprise for the time, but I enjoyed it very much. 
Yeah. yeah, the story of a 16-year-old prostitute who couldn't get it on with the boys, so she goes with the girls, and eventually winds up dead in the subway. Oh, God. But it doesn't say by her own hand. Or by someone else. Yeah, it could have a jealousy thing. It's, it's never like a, stated. It's like a taxi driver vibe. And after that, she, yeah, and after that, she's just casually dismissed. Yeah, what do you expect me. from a 16-year-old yo-yo? Uh, the song is definitely glam rock up the yin yang right down to the gis- distorted guitar and simple drums. It does rock. Now, this is the end of side three, three, which for me is the most forgettable side of the whole album. Okay. The songs are okay, but they never really rise to the level of the usual Elton greatness. And to me, this just seems to be a hazard of the of double album sets, where it just seems like the artist can't seem to sustain greatness for that long. They're just going and going and going, and then there's that one section where it just goes off the rails. But most albums manage to finish strong. Let's see how Elton does on side four. Start of side four. Your sister can't twist, but she can rock and roll. I love that opening where it sounded like the vocals are being thrown back and forth. This man was a blues fan until he met this one girl, and now he's a rock and roll fan for life. I love it when rock artists pay tribute to the music of the 50s by writing a song that sounds like it's from that time period. Think Rattled by the Traveling Wilburys. And I was enjoying it until that organ came in and it sounded like we were at the circus. Almost perfect. And it's a sad almost. (laughs) Ruined it. I I think it's a great song. Mm. Like you said, a celebration of early days of rock and roll. Elton was into R&B until his friend's sister showed him rock and roll is where it's at. Mm -hmm. She can't twist, but she can rock and roll in both senses of the phrase. Mm -hmm. Elton tells his friends and us that she outbucks the Bronx in the rodeo dough. And is that something you really want to tell your friend about their sister? Probably. You want to keep that to yourself. Well, not unless you want to live. Yeah. But Elton is big enough to admit that she's got more soul than he does. And this is definitely 50s music filtered through the 70s. You get greaser background vocal support, and Elton even throws in a little entry of the gladiators. Hmm. I don't know how it got used for circuses, but if you hear the original, it just sounds like a great processional. Um, This should have been a hit. Next track, Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. It's Saturday night, and what do the boys want to do? Round one, fight! My favorite verses are... A couple of the sounds that I really like are the sounds of a switchblade and a motorbike. I'm a juvenile product of the working class whose best friend floats in the bottom of a glass. I knew that I heard this song before from the opening, and as they played those last chords of the guitar and sang the words Saturday over and over, I knew I'd heard it for sure. It's a good rock song, but for some reason, it doesn't grab me, and I can't explain why. Either a song takes a hold of me, or it doesn't, and I can't really explain what makes one do that over another. I can respect that. Yeah. Uh, Bernie based the lyrics on his wild teenage days and the fistfights that would break out at a local pub. Fun. The Aston Arms in Market Rasson, West Lindsay, Lincolnshire, England. Mm-hmm. Quite. <laughs> um, Elton said it was tough to record this song as he overdubbed his piano after the rest of the band had laid down their tracks. Uh-oh. His usual MO was either to play piano first or play along with the band. Totally worth it, though. This is the most kick-ass song on Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Elton makes like he's Jerry Lee Lewis and the band is hard charging through the whole song. A classic. Next track, Roy Rogers. This song is nostalgia for comfort TV as a kid. Mm. Now, I didn't know Roy Rogers was a worldwide phenomenon. I thought he was so in the American zeitgeist of the 50s with Dale Evans that no one outside of the U.S. knew who he was. And I love it when you can tell Elton and Bernie are fanboys because the tributes they write to people they love are beautiful. This was when I thought that Bernie was a Maryland fan. And it doesn't have to be Roy Rogers. Just picture yourself coming home from school on Friday night and turning on your favorite TV show or movie and feeling that life was good and everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. What was that for you? Let us know in the comments. For me, I think that would be Batman, Christmas specials, and Dracula on NBC. And I also remember just now, for me, that was coming on home on Friday after school and reading Rainbow was the first thing on TV with LeVar Burton. Or maybe even MASH and Mary Tyler Moore in my Me TV days. Hmm. How about you? Um, I don't know. Probably Seinfeld. As a kid? 
Oh, as a kid? Yeah. Oh, as a kid. But yeah, as an adult, I could see why Seinfeld would be oh, there for you. Oh, as a kid, I would really have to think about that. I'm really not sure. Um, Hanna Barbera, maybe? Nah. Well, because I think it's like some... Uh, I really don't go back to watch like really old shows these days. Mm-hmm. Um, you do watch old cartoons every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I suppose maybe it's... Uh, Holiday specials, any Charlie Brown one, well, mm-hmm. the, the major ones anyway. Watch Big Beak Productions if you want to break down of all the Charlie Brown holiday specials. Uh, so anyway, a guy's getting older and he's just trying to make it through another nine to five day. He's married and he's got kids and he doesn't have much of a life. But he sits in his armchair and as he says, God bless the TV. A Roy Rogers movie is on and the guy gets to escape back briefly to his childhood. Mm-hmm. And Bernie was a huge cowboy's fan when he was a kid Mm -hmm. um big roy rogers fan Mm -hmm. and um the roy rogers museum closed some years back because that generation has died out people just don't know who he was anymore Mm. i think the closest delton got to being a cowboy was when johnny cash hosted saturday night live and he was a musical guest and they switched outfits cash just looked like he was having fun so i like this song it's it's a beautiful sad song Mm -hmm. next track social disease We're back out in the sticks. Why are these guys so obsessed? We hear the story of a drunk who gets bombed every hour of every day, and that's it. Because it's the only way he can cope with the world around him. My favorite lyric is, I get juiced on, is it Mateus? Mateus? Yeah. And just hang loose. I love a triple rhyme like that. Other than that, after Roy Rogers, I wasn't ready for a hick downer, so I was waiting for it to wrap up. And I realized now what it reminded me of. It'd be like that one hillbilly hick on an episode of Cops who gets caught for doing donuts drunk in the parking lot. And he steps out and goes, Officers, is that a problem? That's what this is. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, so Elton's pretty much bombed all the live long day. He dresses in rags, smells a lot, gets ugly, and older. And a genuine example of a social disease. Mm -hmm. He pays his rent by uh, satisfying his landlady. And (laughs) as he's, well, that's what he says. No, I forgot that part, though. Yeah. Yeah. And his liquor also helps grease her palm. And the song gradually fades in, which is not something you hear a lot. By the time he gets to the chorus, though, it's in full effect. And Davy Johnstone chips in with a banjo. And one Leroy Gomez plays sax. And it's just a fun song. Final track, Harmony. Elton's baby gets out of jail, and at first he's ribbing her. Am I the only man you loved or the only friend you know? But guess what? He still loves her. Isn't that great? And he wants her to open up and they can escape to an island somewhere. I'd like to send them all to an island somewhere. Anyway, now that she's back, their love will never end. A sweet, touching song that is the perfect bow to wrap up this album. Yep, so Harmony shows up in Elton's life again. And he asks a point blank, like you said, if she's turned up because he's the only friend she has left. And yeah, he does love her nonetheless. Mm -hmm. They're pretty good company. He wants to love her forever and dreams of never, never, never leaving her. But But the music seems to be saying it's not going to work out because it kind of sounds like a dirge. I thought it sounded like when he talks about them running away to the island, it sounded kind of dreamlike. So maybe it's them planning where they'll go from there. I didn't pick up on the dirge part. I mean, just the way it starts off was like, hello, when hello, baby, hello, but you listen to that music and I guess it's a minor key, but it just sounds like slow and well, I mean, not plotting, but it's She also like, just got out of jail, so <clears throat> I'm pretty sure she's, you know, kind of a little, you know, rough around the edges now. Well, yeah, but you think he'd be happy to see her and it'd be like, hey, how's it going? Well, maybe he's just stunned and it took him a minute to realize, oh, you got out and you're back. Yeah, it should have been a hit. Okay, it was huge around these parts, especially in Boston, but that's about it. And yes, I have to admit. What? This song reminds me of Harmony from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Aw, well. mm. And maybe that's why it'll never work out, because she's a vampire now. Well, also, even when Spike turned her into a vampire, she was just kind of dumb and kept blowing all his schemes. Yeah, but I don't know. I just always felt kind of bad for her yeah. when she was a vampire. And then she, you know, went on to Angel's TV show. Okay. And she proved to be of some worth. Oh, that's good. Well, so, end of side four, and a nice comeback from side threes. Yeah. Overall, I liked Elton a decent amount as a kid, and this album didn't make my opinion wa- opinion waver higher or lower. It's still the same. Elton is pretty good, and I like some of his songs with Bernie. Does he deserve to be lauded? Sure. 
He's done a lot for music and for charity, and he's a great performer. Listen to this album if you haven't already, and if you find some obscure pieces you like, I think you'll be happy. Yep, so despite the dip in quality on side three, I do recommend that you listen to the whole of Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Then you can decide if you want to own it. All right, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Remember, the more you interact with the video, the greater chance we have of appearing on the YouTube homepage. If you follow me on social media, I post the episodes there. If you're friends with my dad, let him know what you want to listen to, and he'll send it right to your inbox. As always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. We will be back next time with another album to nip and gripe about. Dad, anything you want to say before we sign off? Yes, David Norberg, if you're out there, once again, it's still electric boots, not electric boobs. Now let's go watch Stop Making Sense.